In times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle, be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, I have a Savior. In times like these, I have an anchor. Be very sure, I'm very sure. My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior is He. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there in his hands a wonderful savior is jesus my lord he takes all my burdens away he holdeth me and I shall not be moved. He gives me my strength day by day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that scatters a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hands and covers me there in his hands when clothed in his brightness transported i'll rise to meet him in clouds 
clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows the dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for all that you do for us. We pray that your blessing would be upon us this morning. Lord, all kinds of turmoil going on in this world and all kinds of craziness, but Lord, I know that our foundation should be on the solid rock, and that solid rock is you. Upon you, we build our foundation, Lord. I pray that you'd help us to do that this morning. Help us to worship you, come into our presence this morning in a mighty way, even though we're scattered around all over this country, listening to this broadcast. I pray that you would be in our presence. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning. Sing with me if you would. If you know this, you may not. A lot of people know it. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the from thy wounded side which flow before sin the double cure save from wrath and make me pure not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy lost demands these for sin could not atone Thou must save and thou alone In my hand no price I bring Simply to thy cross I'll cling While I draw this fleeting breath When mine eyes shall close in death When I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Jesus, our rock of ages. I want to welcome you here this morning. I got to get back to my get to the right passage here. I want us to begin this morning in Matthew 7. We're going to be talking about some things, some that we've talked about before and kind of leads up to what I really want to talk about this morning. <clears throat> Unless you are in a cave somewhere, you have seen what's been going on in Washington. Now, listen, I, I've told you, there's a line in Lonesome Dove. Newt, who has found out that Jake Spoon is a pretty rough character. He thought Jake was his dad, I think. Maybe he was close with Jake. Jake had been a one of the three men that kind of mentored him and raised him when he was left an orphan. But he fell in with <clears throat> bad guys and they hung him. And uh, 
Newt was pretty upset, and, and Gus told him, he said that Jake was too leaky a vessel to put much hope in. <laughs> and we've talked about how leaky a vessel the government is, how leaky a vessel the things are that we have put our hope in. We've put way too much hope in the things of man, way too much. And so in Matthew 7, it's talking about this in, in, in so many words, and it begins... Uh, earlier in, in verse 13, really earlier than what we really want to talk about this morning, but I have to back up there so that you get the picture of what we're talking about. It says in chapter 7, verse 13 of the book of Matthew, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits or grapes of wrath from thorn bushes or grapes gathered from thorns bushes or figs from thistles. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many, of, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness." You workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fail. It did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Many of you have probably sung that song when you were little kids. A wise man built his house on the rock. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the rock stood firm. And then the house on the sand went splat. We teach that to little kids all the time. We learn those songs when we're little. There is a great principle in that word. First and foremost, we have to remember that God is telling us to build on a strong foundation. The foundation of this home that this man is building his house on, on rock or on sand, those are figurative lessons about our life. We live in a little bitty farmhouse. We, we bought almost 20 years ago, and it was originally built in 1928, what was the original part of it. The people that owned it before us added on a bedroom and a utility room. Altogether, that made it 900 square feet. <laughs> it's about 1,700 square feet now. <laughs> We've spent a long time getting things added on, but when we did the first addition we did on the far end, the first thing we did was we took beams, four by six womanized beams, 24 feet of them, and we put four of them along the old part of this house long ways and braced it up and built a new foundation, sturdy and on platforms of stone because it was built right on the dirt with a few flat rocks and some, some braces holding it up. That's all that had held this, this house up since 1928. And so the, 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 the floor was just waving and, and big differences in the level in that whole part of the house. So before we could do anything else, we had to structurally build that part up and get a firm foundation for it. Then when we started adding on the other end, we were talking about putting in the, the canisters and filling them with concrete and building the piers and then going up from there. And my neighbor remembered that he had some four-inch oil field pipe that his father had bought back in the 70s for pennies of what it's really worth now. 
laying there in the pasture. And we got that. And we dug holes in the ground until we hit rock. You don't have to go very far in our part of the country, sometimes six inches, but most of these went down three or four feet and we hit rock. And then we put that pipe in the ground, four inch thick walled oil field pipe set in the ground to stone and concreted those in level. And then we put six inch angle iron on top of those. And we put those on five foot centers all the way across and all the way this way. Five foot. Then we put four by six womanized beams on all of those. And then we built the joists and the decking and the walls and the roof on that foundation. The decking is an inch and a half, tongue and groove, plywood decking. The man at Abilene Lumber told me that it was overkill to do all of that and still go on 16 inch centers. <laughs> So my rafters are on two-foot centers. I didn't need 16-inch centers. We built all of that so that that new part would be sturdy. And we tied it hard and fast to the old part that we had restructured. It's been amazing to see as we have gone through the process of remodeling this house, even to this day, even after rebuilding and restructuring everything, we can walk from the end of the house where we put those piers out of four inch oil field down in concrete. You can tell when you get to the other end of the house that is on block on top of the ground, the old part. You can tell the difference because the foundation is different. We're supposed to build our houses on a firm foundation or they will eventually just cave in. He's telling us our life is that way. And I know that the foundation of a horse, or I've said forever, a horse or a child or a dog, it, it really doesn't matter. If you're not training them to do the right thing, you're training them to do the wrong thing. I didn't invent that. That's been said by most reputable horse trainers forever. But in our life, there is a way we are supposed to start out, a foundation. God has called us to build our lives on a strong foundation. In the Bible, it says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. That word train, it means the foundation upon which everything else is based. The word train in the original language in the Hebrew is, is a word that is karnak, and I, I may not be pronouncing that perfectly. I'm no Hebrew scholar, but it's karnak. And what it means literally is to touch the palate. To touch the palate. Now, one of the first things that they do in the hospital, or if a child, all my grandsons were born with midwives at the house. Wonderful midwife my daughter has that's delivered those boys. And Except Oscar was in the hospital. He's a little early. But he could have been at home and been fine. But he had to go to the hospital just because he came a little early. And... The, one of the first things they do is they get that child to nurse. They start him out understanding what it is to nurse. So he gets a strong foundation. The things that are in that first few nursings of mother's milk are the things that will build his immune system and build him up to where he's strong and then he can drink, gain nourishment from that day forward. That same word, Karnak, to touch the palate, can be brought to an analogy of training a horse. You look right back here, there's a Hackamore bow saw. You start out a horse on that bow saw, you get him to learn how to, how to set his head just right. Puts a little pressure on that nose. Over a period of time, you put a bit like this in his mouth. And the point of that bit at first is just for him to hold it and hold the weight of it. Continue to hold his head just right. And then eventually that, that spoon in the middle of that or that port in the middle of that will touch his palate. And he understands the directions you're giving him by that. In the old days where this bit has got rain chains right here. These rain chains. In the old days, when they were training a horse and 
as much as training the horseman, not just training the horse, but training the horseman to do what was right. Part of the foundation of beginning that was they would tie that with a silk string. And if he pulled hard enough to break that string, he was pulling too hard. That bit was not to hit that mouth. It was not a correctional thing or a, or a punishment thing, disciplinary thing. It was direction. And if the horse had been started properly, once he got to that point, it didn't take much. And he knew exactly what he's supposed to do. That's what they call a horse that's straight up in the bridle. That's a very, very simplistic rundown of what that all per ends up being uh, involving and everything like that. I'm not going to go into great detail about that, but the point is the touching of the palate because of the foundation of that horse, because of the way he was started, because of how he was um, taught early on in the process of his training, he learns what that means. Most horse trainers... I do not claim to be a great horseman at all, but I know some great horsemen and every one of them have told me and every one of them has shown me cases where if there's anything left out in the process, if there are any corners cut or uh, shortcuts taken in the beginning, the very starting of that young horse, it can mess them up for the rest of their lives. I have a horse. 20-something years old now, and he's fine. But when I first got him, he was like this with his head. He's like this with his head. Because I know that the place where he came from, when those guys halter broke that horse, because this is what they did, they would get that, not everybody, the guys that halter broke this horse. They got that young horse with that halter. And to get him to pay the attention to them and look at them, they would hit him on the middle of the face, right up at the top of his head and his ears, with the knot on the end of that lead rope. I found that out from the guy I got him from because he had seen him train those horses. He'd seen him halter break those horses. That horse thought that every time you went for his head, he was gonna get hit, and so he was like that. Took him a while not to be scared of his own shadow. But in a case like that, when those, those pieces have been left out or have been, the shortcuts have been taken or things have been done wrong, Sometimes you have to go back to the beginning. When I got Chapo, I took him completely back to the beginning. I put him in a round pen and pretended like he'd never been anywhere where there was a human and started him completely over. Because he had to have a solid foundation. Now, to this day, he's 20, coming 24 years old. I haven't ridden him in probably a year. But I guarantee you I could go get on him right now and I could drag calves this afternoon. He has a foundation that is solid. Now, he doesn't look like much. He's a little rangy, but that's okay because he knows his job because his foundation was set on solid ground. This passage talks about the wise and the foolish builders, but it starts out talking about the choices that we need to make. Entering by the narrow gate. It doesn't just say that very few will go down the narrow gate. It says that. But it doesn't just say that very few will go down it. It says very few will even find it. We've got to be looking for the narrow gate. We can't just follow along with the crowd and go through the wide gate because everybody's going to go down the wide gate if they don't find the narrow gate. He's calling us to find the narrow gate. Look for it. Seek it out. And when we find it, to follow it, even though very few people go that way. He tells us to be careful for false prophets. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, let me tell you something, folks. There's a lot of people spouting a whole lot of stuff. They think they're great theologians these days. Listen, we may be in the end times, and there may be all kinds of stuff happening in the next few months or years that lead towards the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and all of those things that the Bible talks about. But I have very few people that I know on this earth that understand what all that stuff's really talking about. They may think they do, and they've written book after book after book after book about what's going to happen in the end times. And how those guys keep getting published, I'll never know, because every decade they write another book about why the book they wrote last decade was wrong and was off completely and why they know everything now. You have to be careful who you listen to. If someone tells you that the only way 
for the kingdom of God to be glorified on this earth and Christians to get the world and the society that we want is to overthrow the government. Those people are crazy. They're crazy. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Some of them may be well-intentioned, but some of them are wolves in sheep's clothing. And wolves in sheep's clothing don't look like wolves in sheep's clothing. They look like sheep. You have to be careful who you follow. Peter never tried to overthrow the federal government. Paul was imprisoned over and over and over again, beaten, flogged, finally executed in prison as an old man. Peter was crucified just like Jesus was, only they flipped him upside down. James, the brother of Jesus, had his skin and his muscles literally flayed off his body alive. But they didn't try to overthrow the government. They weren't, they weren't afraid to go to jail or to be punished. You say, well, that's pretty crazy. Well, that may be crazy. I don't know. But I know this. They didn't take up arms against the federal government. Folks, I don't know what the answer is for some of the craziness going on in Washington right now. But storming the Capitol and killing people is not the answer. We don't act like Antifa and those crazy people. We don't burn down buildings and shoot cops and attack people. We don't, we, we don't do that. Not Christians don't. There'll be people that'll unfriend me on Facebook and they'll get mad at me for saying this. But you know what? If Peter can be crucified, if Paul can be beaten and in chains most of his adult life, if James can have his skin and his muscle flayed from his body, if John can be boiled in oil for, the, for speaking out and preaching the word of Christ, I'm not too worried about you unfriending me. Doesn't hurt. And I don't care. We have got to do what Jesus Christ told us to do. So our foundation, our, our life has got to be built on a foundation. What did it say about the foundation? It said the wise man is the one that builds his house on a strong, firm foundation of the rock. And the foolish man is the one that builds his on the sand. Now let me tell you something. The Bible says over and over and over again that the things of this world are things that moth and rust will decay. But the things of heaven, the kingdom of God is built on things such as Different than that, far different than that, said such as these are the things of the world, but the kingdom of God is something far different. We're supposed to build our life on the kingdom of God. Jesus. Jesus. The United States was founded on the principles of God, on the word of God. It was founded on his principles. People say that's not true. They say that the, athe that the, the founding fathers were atheists. They say that, that none of that's true, that we've all been lied to in public school. It's not a, that's not true at all. Those are the lies. They flip everything over to be the truth and the lie. We've talked about that before. You can't swap the truth out for the lie. It doesn't work. The fact of the matter is that most of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence were in the clergy and were elders in their church. We've talked about that before. George Washington said, if the Bible ever ceases to be the primary textbook in our schools, crime and mayhem will be rampant in their hallways. Those are the facts, folks. They're not made up by some preacher that wanted to make, head, make uh, headway with some militants against the government. That's not where that came from. Those came from the writings of those men. We have wavered far from those beginnings. See, the problem in our country is not that we got some crazy lunatic people wanting to turn us into socialist or communist. That's not the problem. The problem is, is way back in the 60s, we started turning away from, really earlier than that, but, but literally, not just figuratively, but literally, we began to pass legislation and decide in the 60s that we weren't going to have any more about God. We weren't going to have any more to do with God in this country. We took him out of our schools. We took him out of the public square. We made it illegal to do anything uh, about Christ in the public forum. 
Now, kids can still pray in school, but I can't go lead a Bible study in school. You can't go have lunch with your kids and lead them in Bible study, not like you could when I first started in the youth ministry. That's all changed. Now, we can still preach, we can still sing, we can still pray, we can still serve in any way we want to. We have not come to the point in this country to where we've been stifled with that stuff. But folks, the countries where that stuff is stifled, they didn't get that way overnight. They got that way slowly, bit by bit. And that's why we have to be careful about wolves in sheep's clothing. But listen, if they come to you with a different gospel than Jesus Christ died on the cross, risen from the grave, and in the, on the right hand of the Father in heaven, speaking on our behalf in intercession for our salvation, for us to have a relationship with God in heaven, Jesus and Jesus alone, if they speak to you about anything else, you need to shy away from those people. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. We have got to stay steadfast. We have got to stay strong. We can't place our hope on our jobs. We've seen the economy over the years just go up and down and up and down. The oil field is booming and then it busts and booms and it busts. Same thing with the farming business and the cattle business. Cattle can be sky high one day and then the next day somebody on television say, well, I ate a hamburger and it made me sick. And next thing you know, the beef prices go down through the toilet, depending on who it was that said it. We've got to quit placing our hope on the things of this world. We can't place it in politics or politicians. We can't place our hope in those things. We have gone over that over and over again. I'm not going to go into that again today. But I will tell you how to build your life on a foundation that is solid. That's Jesus Christ. God's word says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means all of us. Every last one of us has sin in our life, and we are under the condition of sin. You know, you don't, you don't die, really, of COVID. COVID causes other things. You don't die of AIDS. AIDS causes other things that make you die. Well, you don't die of drinking, but it's a symptom of sin. You don't die of cheating and lying and stealing and cussing and fighting and all these things we do that are sins, that are wrong things we do that we shouldn't do. We die from the condition of sin, big letters S-I-N, that causes all of those symptoms. We've got to build our life on a foundation that is fighting against the problem, not the little bitty things, but the problem that causes those things that draw us away from a tight, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the first thing you've got to do is admit that you need Jesus. Admit that you can't save yourself because God's word says there is called upon us once to die and then the judgment. Where are you going to be in the judgment? Are you going to be on the side over here with the people that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? They're going to be judged by what you have done on this earth? And the fact that you have rejected Jesus Christ? Are you going to be judged on this side with the people that have accepted Jesus Christ? Well, you're going to be judged according to what you've done since you got saved and for your rewards in heaven. Because the judgment is going to be right there in the middle where it says, do you know Jesus or you not? And you go one way or the other. You can know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior by confessing with your mouth that he is Lord and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And you will be saved. Romans 10. 8, 9, and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10, and 13 says, anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the foundation. That's the very beginning. That's the structure itself that is being built. And then when you build that foundation up from there, you spend time in God's word. You spend time praying. You spend time serving God and doing what he's called us to do. What did he call us to do? Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Everything old is put away. Everything's made new. Paul said, how can we continue in sin, those of us who are dead to it? Do we just keep on sinning so that we get more grace and more grace and more grace? No, that's ridiculous. Heaven forbid, he said. We have to continue from that in our growing in the Lord. 
You can only do that by spending time in his word, spending time in communion with him in prayer. That's how you build your foundation. You also have got to listen to Romans 12 where it says, don't be conformed to this world anymore, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I know some people think I just say the same things over and over again. Maybe I do. But I know that Jesus Christ is the only foundation that we're going to be able to build this world on. Until we start treating each other the way Jesus said to treat each other, it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. And so when we keep building our foundation on the things of this world, when we start to keep depending on uh, our politics and keep depending on our job and, and, you know, what did Jesus say about worrying about all those things? Where you, what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear and, and where you're going to live. He said, the pagans run after those things and your Father in heaven knows you need them. God knows what we need and he will provide what we need. We need to not be clawing after those things. We need to be trusting in Jesus Christ. So today, what do we do? We have a new administration coming in, barring something crazy, er, than has already happened. And I'm not giving up. I haven't thrown in the towel, as some people would say. I'm trying to live in reality. And if we have this new administration come into the White House, we need to do the same thing that God called us to do a long time ago to pray for those he puts in authority or allows to be put into authority. We're supposed to pray for those people. It also said, pray for your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you or spitefully use you, it says. Persecute you. We're supposed to pray for those people. We're supposed to treat people how we want them to treat us. Maybe not how they really treat us. They might treat us terrible. But that's not how we're supposed to treat them. We're supposed to treat them the way we wish they would treat us or want them to treat us. Those are the foundational principles of what we are supposed to be about. That's the solid ground we're supposed to build on because that is Christ-likeness. And your foundation should be Christ-likeness. And you build from there. You say, well, I can't do it. Well, no, of course you can't by yourself. I can't do it by myself either. But God's word says he won't call us to do anything that he won't give us the ability to do it. He will not answer our calls for wisdom, which he says he'll give in abundance. That he will help us to do the task that he's called us to. I've said time and time and time again, Psalm thirty-three, twelve says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Folks, we have got to be a nation whose God is the Lord, but that doesn't start with politics. It doesn't start with the president. It starts with you, and it starts with me. We have got to be the people God has called us to be. Jesus, our one foundation. Jesus, the one upon which everything was built. He was there from the beginning. John 1 says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives life to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son, from the Father full of grace and truth. What are you building your hope on? What do you build your faith in? What is your foundation? Is it solid rock? Or is it the shifting sands? We've seen Democrat. We've seen Republican. We've seen every, every direction in the spectrum, every from one end to the other, of politicians that have led our nation over the years. We've seen them change party. We've seen them flip-flop from here to there. Those are shifting sands. The winds of time change everything. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God says, I am the Lord your God. I do not change. There's going to come a time, even in the near future, when the older parts of this house, even though we've continued to work on it all these years, I'm going to have to go back under this house and I'm going to have to jack some spots up and I'm going to have to shim some things and I'm going to have to make some adjustments along the way because the foundation is not perfect. But the foundation of Jesus Christ is perfect and everything we base on Him and our relationship with Him will, will thrive, will grow, will be safe, will be trustworthy. But if we put our faith and our hope in those other things, they will not. They will not. Eventually, however good the foundation is on this house, it will rust and it will decay. But our relationship with Jesus Christ will continue to grow if we continue to feed it with his word in prayer and in communion with Him, walking with Him daily. It's easier said than done. What are you going to do? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We may not always know the right thing to say or the right thing to do. We may not always do everything right. But we are going to always be striving to build on the foundation of Jesus, not the foundation of the things of this world. They're not worth it. Nice stuff is not worth it. I pray that you will seek Jesus Christ to be your foundation. God's word tells us in Jeremiah, 12, Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13, you will seek me, you will find me, you will pray to me, and I will hear your prayers. But you will only seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Today and every day hereafter, in the midst of the chaos of the decaying, moth-eaten world, place your, found, place your trust on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Seek him with your whole heart and you will find him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the strong foundation that is Jesus Christ. God, some of us have heard these messages and have heard this word of encouragement about the solid rock of Jesus Christ all of our lives. Lord, help me not to take that for granted. Help me not to take for granted the things that I know and understand about those things. But Lord, those who have not heard that all their life, who do not understand what it is we're talking about this morning because of my feeble way of pre portraying your words, Lord, I pray that your spirit would open up their heart. And just like it says in Acts that when we do not even know what to say, the spirit intercedes for us and speaks on our behalf. I pray, Lord, that the spirit would speak on my behalf in the hearts of the people listening today that they would hear your words, they would feel your touch, and the foundation they build from this day forward would be upon you, upon the rock, upon Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here 
listening today, listening to this broadcast, I pray that if there's anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they would build upon that foundation first and say, Jesus, I need a Savior. I'm lost. I need you to save me. Confess their sins. Ask Him to forgive their sins and come to know Him as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that'll happen today. I pray your Spirit would begin to convict their heart. If that's never happened, they'll know it's never happened. Because it isn't just osmosis where you just go to church and eventually you're all right. You need to pray and say, Jesus Christ, save me. I trust you as Lord of my life, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is and that God raised him from the dead. Lord, help us to do that this morning, first and foremost. And then help us to build on that foundation by reading your word, by studying your word, by ruminating on it. And help us to grow closer to you today than we were yesterday, closer tomorrow than we are today. Lord, as we travel the craziness of this world, I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on you. Keep our trust in you. That we might know our foundation is secure. Our anchor holds and grips the solid rock. It's in the name of that rock, the name of Jesus, that I pray. Amen. If you're listening to this broadcast and you'd like to get hold of us in any way, you can go to jeffgore.org, J-E-F-F-G-O-R-E dot O-R-G, jeffgore.org. You can reach us by mail, by email, by phone number, or any number of ways uh, off of that website. You can follow us on Facebook. I have a YouTube channel. You can go and hear lots of other messages from the past lots of music or lots of songs on there we're constantly putting new videos up new songs and, and things like that some cowboy songs some country songs some gospel songs all different kinds of music on there you can follow that on facebook subscribe to my youtube channel uh, look at the people i subscribe to there's some good folks there too you can subscribe to their channels uh, my good friend chef johnny stewart uh, from down in south texas south of san antonio uh, amazing chef amazing amazing pit master uh, that you would love to just, if you like to cook, and if you like food, I, I don't necessarily like to cook, but I sure like to eat. So I watch him all the time. Join us uh, on YouTube, and then join some of those people that we listen to, that listen to us, that have subscribed to us as well. God bless you. We love you. I hope that you have a wonderful day. And in spite of what may go on around us in this world, trust Jesus. Trust him. Because our hope needs to be in Jesus, the foundation, the solid rock. We'll see you next week right here on Facebook, 10 o'clock Sunday morning. Hope that you'll join us. We love you. God loves you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.